This is probably the most disturbing case I've covered on this channel so far. I know I say that in a lot of my true crime videos, but somehow I always end up outdoing myself in the worst way possible. This case has been referred to by numerous sources as the worst case of child abuse in U.S. history. The story also contains references to sexual abuse, so if that's something that you'd rather not hear, I won't be offended if you click away. If you're still here, thank you so much for watching. This is the case of Brianna Lopez. There aren't many details of Brianna's early life. We do know she was born Brianna Mariah Lopez on February 14, 2002 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Las Cruces is a town of about 100,000 people, about 45 miles north of the Mexican border. For all, or at least most of her life, Brianna lived in a mobile home with her mother, 19-year-old Stephanie Lopez, her father, 21-year-old Andy Walters, her grandmother, Patricia Walters, and her uncle, Stephanie's twin brother, 19-year-old Stephen Lopez. Brianna also had an older brother who was 18 months old at the time, but there's not really any other information about him. Altogether, nine people lived in the trailer. I don't know exactly who the other ones were. I believe there was another son named Robert Walters. On the night of July 18th, 2002, when Brianna was about five months old, Andy Walters got off work around 5 p.m. and arrived home around 6 p.m. At about 8 p.m., he went to pick up Stephen Lopez at work. They went and bought a case of beer, then returned home. Andy, Stephen, and Stephanie spent the rest of the evening at home with baby Brianna. Stephanie later claimed she drank two or three beers before falling asleep around 10 p.m. Stephen would later claim she actually drank closer to five or six beers. After Stephanie went to bed, Stephen and Andy played with Brianna by throwing her in the air. She hit her head on the ceiling twice and was dropped on the floor three times. She was conscious and crying the whole time. Stephanie later said she never heard Brianna cry that night. It wasn't the first instance of abuse. A few weeks earlier, Stephanie had witnessed Andy throwing Brianna in the air. She told him not to do this because it would hurt Brianna. Stephen later admitted to throwing Brianna in the air and not catching her. Andy later said he bit Brianna on several occasions, and he wasn't the only family member who had done so. He said Stephanie often pinched and threw Brianna out of frustration. Stephen also admitted to sexually abusing Brianna. Back to the night of the 18th, Andy fell asleep around 12.30 a.m. and at the time didn't know where Brianna was. He woke up around 3 a.m. and found Brianna on the floor, close to the bed, I assume his bed. He wrapped her in a blanket and put her in a bouncer. Stephanie woke up at some point in the early morning and noticed around 7 a.m. that Brianna needed a diaper change. She noticed bruising on Brianna's body and asked Andy about it, who said that he and Stephen played a little rough with her. Andy changed Brianna's diaper and gave her a blanket. Another report said Stephanie woke up around 9.45 a.m. I'm not sure if one of these sources was inaccurate or if she woke up around 7, fell back asleep, and woke up again around 9.45. At around 10 a.m. that morning, July 19th, Stephanie checked on Brianna and noticed she wasn't breathing. She and Andy tried to give Brianna CPR, and they called 911. Another source said Brianna's parents actually called her grandmother instead of 911. Remember, Brianna did live with one of her grandmothers, Patricia Walters, but if this report is true, I'm not sure if it refers to Patricia or where she was at the time. Brianna was taken to Memorial Medical Center in Las Cruces, but already appeared lifeless when she arrived. There were more attempts to resuscitate her, but they didn't work. She was pronounced dead at 11.10 a.m.
Stephanie told the hospital staff that Brianna had gotten her injuries by falling out of bed, but the autopsy results said otherwise. Brianna's entire body was covered in bruises and bite marks. Andy initially said that Brianna's older brother had caused the bite marks, but later admitted to causing them himself. Brianna had fractures on her legs and arms, two broken ribs, skull fractures, bleeding of the optic nerves, and brain swelling. The forensic pathologist concluded that she died from cranial and cerebral injuries, and that her injuries were a mix of old and new ones. Her death was listed as homicide. During the subsequent investigation, no photos of Brianna were found in the mobile home. One has surfaced later on a few news articles and blogs, the one that you should be seeing right now. It looks like her, but I'm not 100% certain. But they didn't find any in the initial investigation. With nothing else to work with, investigators took a picture of Brianna taken after her death and touched it up, creating the photo that you're seeing now. I don't normally like including pictures of dead bodies in my videos, but in this case, my options were limited. There are plenty of far more graphic photos taken of Brianna after her death. I didn't want to include them here because I wasn't sure people wanted to see them, but if you do want to look for yourself, they are very easy to find. Stephen and Stephanie Lopez and Andy Walters were all arrested and charged in connection with Brianna's death. Patricia Walters and a man named Robert Walters, who I assume was another son, also faced charges of failing to report child abuse. I couldn't find exact dates of arrest, but all five defendants went on trial together at some point in the fall of 2003. At some point before the trial, Stephanie requested to have her trial separated from the other defendants. She knew they would be able to testify against her if their trials were held together, even though they didn't actually end up doing this. Her request was denied. The trial was moved to Albuquerque, about a three and a half hour drive north, because of the media coverage in Las Cruces. Andy's lawyer said it was unlikely that four people had all committed murder, and he claimed there was no physical evidence that tied Stephen and Andy to the crime. But the jury disagreed. On September 12, 2003, after about a day of deliberation, all five defendants were found guilty, I believe, of all the charges against them. Andy Walters was found guilty of child abuse resulting in death, criminal sexual penetration of a minor, child abuse not resulting in great bodily harm, and conspiracy to commit child abuse resulting in death. He was later sentenced to 57 years in prison. Another source said he was sentenced to 63 years. Stephen Lopez was found guilty of child abuse resulting in death, criminal sexual penetration of a minor, and conspiracy. He was later sentenced to 51 years in prison. Stephanie Lopez was found guilty of negligent child abuse resulting in death and negligent child abuse not resulting in great bodily harm. She was later sentenced to 27 years in prison. Patricia and Robert Walters were found guilty of failing to report child abuse. They were sentenced to 60 days in jail. In 2004, a Supreme Court ruling said if there was a case with multiple defendants and one of them gave a statement that was incriminating to another, that statement couldn't be used in trial unless the defendant who gave the statement testified at the trial. All of the defendants in Brianna Lopez's murder trial gave statements like this, but none of them actually testified at the trial. In 2006, the Court of Appeals reversed the convictions of Stephen, Stephanie, and Andy, who had all appealed their convictions. They were set to be retried separately, but this ruling was reversed in 2007 and their initial sentences and convictions upheld. Brianna Lopez was buried in a pauper's grave in Doña Ana Cemetery. None of her family members claimed her body, and her funeral was paid for by strangers. Dozens, if not hundreds of people, came by her grave to leave flowers and other mementos. After a while, her family put up a cage around her grave to keep people out. But that didn't really seem to stop anyone. After the cage was put up, these mementos were simply left 
outside the cage. In or around 2010, a petition to remove the cage got over 200,000 signatures from people all over the world. Amy Orlando, who was the chief deputy district attorney at the time, wanted to find the owner of the cemetery and see if they could reverse the family's decision. The groundskeeper did eventually agree to tear down the fence near the grave so a bench could be put in as a memorial. In a prison interview, Stephanie Lopez claimed she wasn't aware of the grave and would try to get it removed. But Susana Martinez, who prosecuted the case and who we'll talk more about in a second, claimed she asked Stephanie if the community could donate a headstone, and Stephanie said no. After Brianna's death, a new bill would be introduced that would come to be informally known as the Baby Brianna Bill or Brianna's Law. At the time of Brianna's death, the maximum sentence for child abuse resulting in death was 18 years in prison. This new bill would change the penalty to an automatic life sentence if the child was younger than 12. There is conflicting information about the bill. A lot of sources said it would change the penalty to an automatic life sentence, but others said it would change it to a minimum sentence of 30 years. Another source said it would be an automatic life sentence, but with the possibility of parole after 30 years. This one makes the most sense to me, both on its own and as an explanation for all of the seemingly contradictory information. The bill was signed into law in 2005. One of the main people pushing it was Susanna Martinez. Martinez was the district attorney of Dona Ana County at the time and prosecuted Brianna Lopez's case. She later served as the governor of New Mexico from 2011 to 2019. One of her campaign ads featured Brianna's case and Brianna's law. While in prison, Stephanie Lopez was said to be quiet and well-liked by other inmates, never causing any major problems. She also became a clerk for the prison's chaplain and requested prayer from at least one other inmate on multiple occasions. Was this newfound religion genuine or just an attempt to make herself look good? I'll let you decide that for yourself. If it was the latter, it might have worked. Due to good behavior, Stephanie Lopez was set to be released from prison in 2016. At one point, that date was pushed back to 2017, but again pushed up to September 2016. At the time, I believe inmates were required to serve at least 85% of their sentence. Stephanie wasn't required to do this because at the time, child abuse wasn't considered a violent crime. I believe the law has changed since then. Around 2010, a change.org petition was started to revoke Stephanie Lopez's parole upon her release. The petition got over 60,000 signatures, but a 2011 comment from the person who started it seems to imply that the request was revoked. Stephanie Lopez was released from prison on September 21st, 2016, after serving 13 years of her 27-year sentence. She was required to serve two years of parole, which should be up by now. Upon her release, Stephanie was transferred out of state as part of an interstate compact. At first, the state she would be moving to was undisclosed. It was later revealed that she would be serving her parole in the Plainview area, a city about 50 miles north of Lubbock in northern Texas. Needless to say, Plainview residents were not happy about this. Another change.org petition was started to keep Stephanie out of Texas. It only got about 1,600 signatures. I have no idea what results it got, if any, or where Stephanie Lopez is today. The death penalty was repealed in New Mexico in 2009. I'm assuming at least in part due to this case, Susana Martinez has proposed to reinstate it for those convicted of child abuse resulting in death. Andy Walters and Stephen Lopez are serving their sentences out of state, though I'm not sure which state. They're expected to be released in 2025 and 2022, respectively. 
So like I mentioned earlier, Susanna Martinez, Amy Orlando, and several others pushed hard for Brianna's law and got it passed. But as happy as they were with these results, they wanted the law expanded from pretty early on. Their desired expansion would take away the age restriction, resulting in a life sentence for those convicted of child abuse resulting in death, regardless of the child's age, as long as they were under 18. The push for this expansion was really kicked into high gear after the death of Victoria Martins. Victoria was an Albuquerque girl who was killed on her 10th birthday, August 24th, 2016. She was drugged, sexually assaulted, strangled, and stabbed. Then her body was dismembered and wrapped in a blanket that was set on fire. Victoria's mother, her mother's boyfriend, and the boyfriend's cousin were all charged in her murder. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like Brianna's law worked here. Victoria's mother, Michelle Martins, accepted a plea deal and faces between 12 and 15 years in prison. Her boyfriend, Fabian Gonzalez, is still awaiting trial as of now. Gonzalez's cousin, Jessica Kelly, also accepted a plea deal and is looking at between 20 and 50 years in prison. Unknown male DNA was also found on Victoria's body, and this male is being investigated as the fourth suspect, albeit as a John Doe. After the death of Victoria Martins, lawmakers realized that if she had been just three years older, Brianna's law wouldn't have applied to her killers at all, though it didn't seem to do much anyway. The Brianna's Law expansion was cleared by the New Mexico House of Representatives in 2016. It was approved by the House Judiciary Committee in 2017 and moved to the State Senate in 2018. I couldn't find too much on it after this, and I don't believe it ultimately became law. So that's all I have for you today on Brianna Lopez. I know it's an extremely disturbing story, and I wondered if I should even share it at all. But I do think it serves as a reminder that if you see something suspicious, you should speak up. You might save a life. It also shows us the passion people have to help others. Brianna's own family didn't seem to care for her much, but thousands of strangers did. They couldn't save her in life, but they did everything they could to make sure she was honored in death. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope you will consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.